planned for you today. Matters series continuing with Cornelius Bartlett. He will be in house with us today. Plus, we are telling you all about a holy convocation that's coming up. We want to make sure that you are aware of the entity behind it and the people behind it and how you can go ahead and get involved. Plus, we are going to be interviewing a very interesting man by the name of Jason Green as we observe April as a month that we acknowledge amputees. So that is going to be our personality feature for today. And RBC will be in the house. That's right. Our friends from Royal Bank of Canada are telling us all about the race for kids. Their managing director, Shimon McIntosh, will be joining us from out of the island. And Mikhail Bisson and Professor Winston Moore, deputy principal at the UEK Phil campus, they're all going to be here to share more about that all-important initiative but we want to start telling you all about something very very interesting um we're going to speak with two young men who are already here with me who are talking about caribbean futurism so what does that mean what is it and how can we get involved the only people that can answer that question at this stage are evan mcdonald who is of the center for hybrid studies he's artist and curator good morning Morning. Morning. And also here is Micah Arthur, Thanks. also of the Center for Hybrid Studies, the research associate. So good morning to both of you and good to have you with us. Yes, good morning. Good to be here. Thank, Thank you. you. I hope you had a wonderful weekend. We did have a good weekend, yes. I think, yeah. Yeah, it was okay. You had to think about it for a moment. I did. I'm trying to It was a blur. It was a blur. What about you, Micah? It was wonderful as well. Yeah. did some live painting this Saturday at the music festival. So it was... Oh, yeah. that sounds good. Live painting. Uh, I haven't seen that for a while. But let's get into this. Uh, now, you say that Barbados quadricentenary in 2025. Yes. Um, the Center for Hybrid Studies is presenting Carry Futurism with a focus on African descendants. Yes. So tell us a little bit more about all of that. You, mm -hmm. you have to unpack it in parts. In piece by piece. So first of all, talk about the Center for Hybrid Studies. Oh, well, the Center for Hybrid Studies is a developmental project with Dr. Murray and Ms. Camelia Allen. And what they try to do is that they try to look at more so the creolization, but with a focus on African heritage and identity. Right? So this could be how we eat, how we speak, how we express ourselves, um, with a specific look on like spirituality and plants and so forth, and how we are sort of all connected still to like an African origin and heritage. All right, so that certainly tells us what, what it's about. Now we're moving toward carry futurism with mm -hmm. a focus on African descendants. That's the next right. stage. Yes, please. So continuing the focus on Africanness and African descendants, Car Futurism is a specific look at Caribbean's opportunity for the future, right? So I don't know if you've ever heard about Afrofuturism, which is probably a little more popular. You can think like Black Panther, Wakanda, right? Sort of taking traditional African aspects and making them a more futuristic type of appeal. Unfortunately, Afrofuturism, they tend to focus on our African-American persons. So we sort of get left out of the situation. We're sort of left in the water. Then try to figure out how we fit in. Carafuturism is going to give us an opportunity to focus on Barbados and the Caribbean specifically, right? How we could develop as a country um, and allow us to show our own cultural identity as well. All right, so that really puts things in perspective. Okay. And then having you, Micah, talk about what you did this weekend, I think kind of gives us a view of maybe where we're going. So talk mm -hmm. to me about your role then as a research associate and how that all ties into the entire carry futurism well as you were saying we are looking to break away from that mold and try to identify some unique elements that we have our focus on. sorry i would say focus on here in the caribbean so that would be more so like a symbiosis between nature and technology more so I would, you would even more call it biotech. Yeah, they like go biotech. Yeah, just for individuals. But we want to move away from individuals and actually have a function. So we're looking to incorporate different departments such as agriculture, uh, science, research, get more young people, and not even just young people, but more people involved mm -hmm. that could add to this. Well, I don't think that you two are, you know, you will know exactly what I'm talking about. But when I was younger, there was a show called The Jetsons. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Exactly. I used to think that was so far <laughs> off, yes. you know, flying cars uh -huh. and Indeed. houses in the sky and this and that. And yeah. these days, owing to everything that's happening, mm -hmm. we most certainly don't think that that's, that's far, far away. Off. I mean, yeah. we're in an age where we have self-driving cars Indeed. they're not driving the way we need them to drive <laughs> Just all true, yes. of the time uh -huh. but we have self-driving cars and all of this other stuff so mm -hmm. when you talk micah about kind of incorporating different segments and sectors of society yeah. mm -hmm. i can see exactly what you mean but when we think of maybe our future a hundred years from now what are some of the elements that you're looking to bring together for this particular event or series of events because I can see that you know you can start it in a, in a certain way but you certainly have to continue that will kind of bring people along to, to continue this thinking of what could happen in future. Mm -hmm. So again because we're at that quadricentenary marker we're gonna have 400 years since the British arrived and claimed the island for James I right so you want to have a clear focus on is not only, as you mentioned, with the Jetsons. So when people think future developments, the idea is the very tall buildings, lots of steel, the flying cars, right? How we can advance technology-wise. But with the exhibitions, we really want to focus on not just technology-wise, building-wise, but spiritually, um, education-wise, even flashing sustainable living, really. Um, he would have mentioned, Michael would have mentioned the science, the biotech a lot of the different aspects that come into play when you consider a future, especially because we are currently in what you would describe like a climate crisis. You want to make sure we're setting a situation where we can now grow and sustain ourselves, right? Because the problem is sustainability for what we're doing. Absolutely. I can, uh, you know, for me, a lot of people start maybe with what the future will look like, even though you said that. And um, there, there are many different elements, as you mentioned, but in order to get there, it will take people like, like you, visual artists, to, to kind of help us get there. So talk to me about where you've been going in, in terms of your line of thought in moving toward this future Barbados, future Caribbean. Hmm. Well, I would say we've been looking into like the sustainable uh, route when it comes to housing, for example, because there's a type of housing, the eco-friendly housing called Cob, uh, Cob? Mm -hmm. yeah, Cob Homes, that you could use rammed earth, or I would say different substitutes that are naturally occurring, right? So that's one thing. Uh, another thing is also creating more of a focus on, like for example, the limestone helmet I have in this artwork here, to give that sense of oneness with the environment, right? Because we want people to be more aware of that and what we can do with the environment around us. Like for the natural remedies that we would be focusing on with the plants you mentioned earlier. Yeah, we want to re-educate everybody about different medicinal plants that we have around. It's just advancing and creating imagery around those subjects. So let's talk about how this will all unfold. So we're starting in 2024 relatively um, gently, nice and easy. 2025 is the year of the actual quadricentenary. So it's May 14th, 2025 is when you will start the 400 year process. But what we're doing in 2024 is that we're starting with a series of art exhibitions. So we can sort of slowly introduce the themes and topics to people. And in Barbados, I find one of the best ways to do that is visually, right? So we're starting April 14th, um, which is about oh, six days away. No, exactly six days away. So April 14th is when we start uh, with my solo exhibition, which is Kingdom of Barbados. Tell me more about Kingdom of Barbados. Absolutely. Okay, so Kingdom of Barbados is my first solo exhibition. Um, the process is going to, full, well, no, not the process. The exhibition itself is from the perspective of an enslaved person imagining what life could be if the Buster Rebellion was successful. Um, you would have asked what we're doing as it relates to the futurism topic and how we're going to help um, display that to people. One of the best ways to give people an idea as to who they want to be in the future is to first ground them in who they are now. But in order to do that, you have to look at who you were and not only who you were, but who you were before things were taken and exploited. What Kingdom of Barbados does is that it gives the opportunity for us to give our enslaved ancestors imagination. So it gives us sort of the perspective that they would have thought and imagined and hoped um, before the Buster Rebellion would have actually taken place. 
Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, talk to me about where you are going with with your particular input into this entire project. Well, I'm just like he's creating a foundation to start everybody off visually and from a knowledgeable perspective as well. So from here, I guess I could world build, as you would say, using some already present elements we have today. Right? All right. Evan, talk to me about more about about your installation, your mm -hmm. your project, your presentation. Um, I'm thinking about it and we don't often think in tho those terms of what our ancestors mm -hmm. might have been thinking as slaves yeah. and what they would have been imagining mm -hmm. in terms of being free and what that meant, yeah. what it looked like. Exactly. So all these years later is mm -hmm. what you're asking us to, to kind of look back and yeah. internalize where they might have been. Mm -hmm. And then where does the next phase come in where people not only reflect, mm -hmm. but then they kind of um, try to push their insight for what might happen future-wise. Right. I was thinking about that just yesterday. Um, because it's Sunday, I'm thinking of having like an offering basket. So persons could put in like what they th would like to see moving forward with the future, with the, Afro with the Cara Futurism exhibitions. And even for this project, it's something that I would like to do again in the future because there's so much about the Bus Rebellion that goes um, uninformed that we don't get a lot of information on. And so it requires a lot of digging. So I think it's an exhibition that you will have to see again in the future, um, yeah. Talk to me about uh, some of the pieces that you use to be able to bring it to life. Yes, please. So with this, what I'm doing, there are six portraits um, that show the six more critical leaders of the rebellion. So you have Nanny Greg of Simmons, Jackie of Simmons, Bussa and Kilt Wiltshire of Bailey's. You have Mingo of Biden Mill. And then you have Joseph Pitt Washington Franklin, who's a quadroon freed man of color. Right? So there's these six portraits of them. So it's sort of showing them in more African-based regalia. A lot of people don't know that before the Bus Rebellion, Afro-Barbadians were sort of developing their own culture away from the British. So they were sort of doing their own thing in the slave huts and so forth. So it's gonna look at if that had continued. So you have the six portraits. You also have some flags that are based on some rebellion flags that were made, that were discovered during the ransacking of the hats. You have some costumes that I'm actually still in the process of working on, so I'm hoping they're ready for at least Thursday. But one is a cane fire costume inspired by the Shaggy Bear, so it's lots of old cane trash. And the other is a Yomoja costume, right? So it's the connection to like, the water and the preservation of persons during the transatlantic slave trade. There's also these smaller paintings that I'm calling reclaimed images because you're imagining if their ancestors were successful, if, they're, if the Bus Rebellion was successful, it is from the perspective of them imagining life for their descendants, right? So there are these smaller reclaimed images um, that are from photographs, largely postcards, that were taken from 1880 uh, with four little girls who were cane laborers to 1980 with my grandmother. So I'm painting over those and showing them in more um, regal and um, dignified positions. Well, that's, that certainly is a, is a great deal. And I'm, I'm very intrigued. So we're going to continue to talk about this exhibition and all that we can look forward to with Caribbean Futurism with Micah and Evan after this break. Stay with us. Morning, morning, morning. Good morning. Good morning to you. Tune in to CBC Newsnight for the NISS Business Report, a comprehensive look at the local, regional, and international business world every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday during CBC Newsnight. Brought to you by the National Insurance and Social Security Service. More than a contribution, it's your lifeline. Every day at 7 p.m., we bring you a comprehensive news package because keeping you informed is our number one priority. Whether it's local, regional, or international stories, our commitment is to you and keeping you reliably informed. Join us every day at 7 p.m. for CBC Newsnight.
The facts say Morning Barbados reaches an audience of over 50,000 and Newsnight reaches over 56,000. It's simple. When you advertise, you're getting your message to over 50,000 of your potential customers. Make the call to CBC Sales Department today and watch your business grow. Contact us at 467-5559 or email marketing at cbc.bb. Good morning indeed. So the sun is peeking out even though we had some drizzles earlier this morning and we're hoping for a little bit of rain. Uh, we certainly have uh, the sunshine peeking out. Still some cloud cover. I'm not your meteorologist, but uh, peeking outside maybe we'll get a chance to show you some of uh, that for those of you who are still in bed. Lucky, lucky you getting to sleep in on this Monday. Maybe it's holiday. Maybe you're retired. Uh, maybe you're just at home because you're not. Thank you for choosing Morning Bar. To Evan and Michael, and they're with the Center for Hybrid Study. They're telling us all about how they're anticipating Barbados quadricentenary in 2025, starting with a very interesting exhibition that's coming up in another few days that really is going to showcase or look back at uh, Barbados at a time where. Uh, the slaves were preparing for a rebellion and kind of forcing us to think about what they would have been thinking about in future and if that rebellion would have been successful. Have absolutely. they been able to, to kind of summarize it? it? That was a very good <laughs> summary. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, absolutely. So, <laughs> uh, I mean, there are so many questions about, yeah. about where you would go with it. And as an artist, I would imagine that, you know, this would be something for you, Micah, to, to kind of unpack. I always wonder for authors how they're able to come up with some of these grand plots. And I think it's where we let the imagination just run wild, particularly in little children. I think for, for people who are able to express themselves, uh, they make for amazing artists. Correct. Uh, because, you know, they go unhindered with their thoughts, with their views, with their ideas. What say you? I agree, actually. And not just for artists, like, all fields have a level of creativity, right? Because that's access to, I would say, the closest thing to the creator that you could get. So I would encourage everybody to tap into that more so. Even if you're no longer in school, just tap into the creative forces because that's where part of the Carib Futurism movement is going as well. I saw you nodding in an agreement, Evan. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that creativity and encouraging creative spaces, especially with young children, has a lot of healing and positive um, effects on the society. You know, we, we hear it a lot from government sometimes, but sometimes it feels like they don't put too much of the sprinkle of, of, of investment in it. But yes, I think, I think creative spaces and cultivating creative spirits in people has a lot of emotional benefit. I mean, it's, it's scientific. People do like art therapy and so forth. So it's definitely very critical for a society to have a focus on creative, creative industries and so forth. What's your vision for the celebration as we go forward? Mm. Because this most certainly is nothing that I've thought about. <laughs> yes. I mean, but now it's living in my head. Good. I Very can't, good. I can't yes. get it out of my head. But yeah. as we look forward to uh, 400 years yeah. since the initial settlement, that, that's major. Mm -hmm. And to reflect on what happened yeah. and to look forward to what might be, Mm -hmm. that's that's major so how are you hoping yeah. that this is observed going forward mm -hmm. um but we really want a national observation um growing up in the church 40 years is very significant because it represents the fullness of a generation so we would have 10 full generations <laughs> in 400 years so you need like a natural you need mourning so a mourning but with because we come from an african tradition celebration as well so we think lots of bright colors drums um, we definitely want music poetry um, but a sequence of nationally recognized events that everyone can participate in would be fantastic. What do you think something like this will do for not only young Barbadians, but older Barbadians as well? Mm -hmm. I think it would create a space for people to feel more comfortable mm -hmm. with their own individual ideas and probably just work together as a collective to make not just this island better, but the entire region as we go forward. 
how does what's happening online play into all that we're doing? Because I've been saying for quite some time now that the diaspora have been working even harder than those of us here <laughs> to make everything Caribbean fashionable. Mm. So some of them are second and third generation Barbadians and, and Caribbeans, as mm -hmm. they're calling them now. But they are so excited to be connected to our culture and our heritage that it's as if th they're kind of bringing us along, <laughs> particularly when it comes to carnivals and Caribbean yes. foods and everything culturally. Mm -hmm. So how will this play into uh, what we're hoping to bring through for, for this future Caribbean? Mm, that's a good point. I'm not sure if that's something to be fully considered, but you are right. The diaspora has sort of been doing a better job really preserving a lot of things um, outside of us. So that, that would be something to involve. But the social media aspect is something that you would have to consider and it's something that we will have to focus on fully developing. I think so far, because the exhibitions are now drawing close, that's been our main attention, but social media technology involvement will be something to look forward to, for yeah. sure. It most certainly will shape the way that we do everything, because if we, if we think, at, in, to use a Bajan term, how, how AI is moving at breakneck speed, <laughs> Yes. Because the truth is, uh, if what they're releasing to the public is what they want us to see. Mm -hmm. But usually there's so much technology that's so far advanced yeah. that may be held secret by... You know, maybe, <laughs> yeah. I don't know, it's because some sometimes you think it's a conspiracy layer. theory. Like a back but, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. th they show us what they want us to see, but imagine what they're going to hold back. And what they're working on. Yes. Yeah, because mm -hmm. the U.S. military isn't going to give us everything. <laughs> no. Definitely not. You know, so I'm thinking future point. already mm -hmm. uh, in terms of AI, based on what AI can do now, it is mind boggling yeah. to think about what a society could look like a hundred years from now. Mm -hmm. That's a good Absolutely. Point. So let's wrap up yeah. on uh, talking about Kingdom of Barbados by you, Evan. Yes, please. Um, you're launching the series, as you mentioned, on the 15th? 14th. 14th. The 14th, mm -hmm. which is next Monday. Oh no, this Sunday, this, this coming Sunday. This coming Sunday, mm -hmm. I'm off with the dates. Don't worry about no, it. No, this was Sunday. This way. Yeah, I'm, 14th of April. The this 14th, coming Sunday. which is this coming Sunday, mm -hmm. and it's at the Old Spirit Bond Mall. Old Spirit Bond okay, Mall. Okay, so go go from there. Yes, please. So 14th of April, Sunday, 12 to 2 p.m. Right. So about noonish, and we're going to be at the Old Spirit Bond Mall, and that will be the opening of the exhibition as well as the launching of the Cara Futurism series. Um, we hope that you will come and you will experience it. I have a good time. Um, some aunties are making some snacks and some drinks, so we're looking forward to that. It's Barbadian based stuff. One of my aunties is making cheesecakes for like a. She's trying to find a Barbadian topping, guavas are not in season. But there'll be snacks, there'll be food, there'll be things to enjoy, as well as the art that we hope you can take part in um, visually and spiritually and emotionally as well. So, are you going to keep us um, updated about? What are the ways you will be showcasing uh, uh, throughout mm -hmm. time? Because you said this is the launch. This is the launch of it, yes. Yes, it's so deep. I would imagine there will be other things to see and exhibitions Definitely. and so on as time goes on. Yes, please. Actually, Michael will be having one in, July. in the summer period in July. Yeah. Yes, and the other yeah. gentleman, Daniel Botsy, will have mine in October. Ha so, have hmm. you shaped yours already or are you still working on what it will look and feel like? Well, they're just adding some final touches in that case because I already have everything laid out. It's just building one or two more pieces. That's about it. All right, so something to consider. Uh, Crop Over is also celebrating, I believe, half a century. Yes. This year. So 50 years of Crop Over Whoa. for 2024. Yeah. That's something to involve. So that's something to consider. Really good ideas. Thank you. <laughs> yes. I want to yeah. thank you guys for coming in and sharing with us. Thank you. For putting us in, in that frame of mind, I think is very interesting to kind of think about the future yes, and all yes. that it will hold while reflecting on our past mm -hmm. and considering what our ancestors would have been thinking about. And yes. if this is all they thought it would be. This is true. I would say that within those 10 generations, probably not, because most old people tell you, I wish it was the old time days. 
True. I do wish to sort of tell yeah. her about sometimes. Yes. I'm at the stage now where I too am old and wishing mm -hmm. it was the old time days too. So oh. I guess every generation does that as they reflect. I guess, I guess I'm getting a sprinkle you know? of that now. Yes. But the ironic the, the, is my daughter is going to kill me for this. She was talking to uh, somebody at the primary school level just yesterday and okay. she said, you know, they were saying, oh, we would love to be back in primary school. And the primary school child was uh -huh. saying, no, you wouldn't. It's not what you uh -oh. think it is. What? And I mean, they're literally, you know, <laughs> they're, they're still children. So, I mean, uh -huh. I guess we're reflecting across generations, which is yes. what this is all about. Uh, I love uh, what you call it, carry futurism. So, um, and I love that you placed it in the context of thinking of what they presented as a Wakanda which will not necessarily what our Caribbean would look like. We need our own Wakanda. All right, I love yes. that. So thank you so much, Evan McDonald, um, yes. artist and curator, and Micah Arthur, research associate with the Center for Hybrid Studies. Mm -hmm. Good to have you with us. Yeah, thank thank you. you for having good us. Good to be here. Thank right. you. And a special good morning to Dr. Derek Murray. <laughs> Always good to have you viewing. I we certainly look forward to hearing a lot more about what is on offer. All right, so the time is quickly going by. It's already 6.30. 30. Coming up next, we're going to tell you all about something fantastic that is coming up. Uh, it's a convocation. What does that mean and who will be involved and how can you become involved? All that and lots more next. Morning, morning, morning. Good morning. Good morning to you. Every night, we bring you a complete look at the weather forecast because keeping you safe and informed is our top priority. The CBC Weather Report, brought to you by Ace h and Hardware, the helpful hardware. Morning Barbados is on the move and we're coming to you every weekday morning from right here at the Standard Showroom in Wildey. Now, together, we're giving you an opportunity to win. All you have to do is submit a photo of that room that you want to see changed in a fantastic way. And the interior design curator here at Standard and all of their experts are going to get together and select the room that needs the most work. It just might be yours. All you have to do is submit your photo to info at standard.bb and you could be here with us saying, Morning Barbados, look at my beautiful space. Tune in to CBC Newsnight for the NISS Business Report, a comprehensive look at the local, regional, and international business world every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday during CBC Newsnight. Brought to you by the National Insurance and Social Security Service. More than a contribution, it's your lifeline. Every day at 7 p.m., we bring you a comprehensive news package because keeping you informed is our number one priority. Whether it's local, regional, or international stories, our commitment is to you and keeping you reliably informed. Join us every day at 7 p.m. for CBC Newsnight. Welcome back to Morning Barbados. I hope you're having a good Monday morning. People talk about Monday morning blues. I have no clue what that is. Yes, I am always skinning my teeth, <laughs> as my mother calls it. So uh, always something to smile about. Just always remember that. So let me say a special good morning to Bishop Howard Daniel Sr., um, presiding prelate. Yes, ma'am. All right. And also here is Pastor Deidre Boyce and Pastor Linda Herbert. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. Good, morning. Good to have all of you with us. Yes, it's, a, it's awesome to be here. All right, good stuff. So I'm going to start with you, Pastor Linda, because we've been communicating. Um, you, you know, you're the one who kind of made the connection. Yeah. So even though I recognize Bishop 
Howard, having been here before and have to say welcome back, mm -hmm. I'd love for you to kind of set the scene of what we're talking about uh, based on the fact that we have a few visitors who are coming and you're based here in Barbados. Yes, please. Um, we are talking about our um, upcoming convocation. The last thing the bishop was here, he actually came here to install me as a minister. And now he's back. He um, installed two more ministers. And um, under his our organization, which is Sea God. And um, so we have like four churches here now in Barbados. All right. So talk to me, Bishop, about Sea God, um, uh, that particular um, body. Sea God is, uh, stands for, it's an acronym that stands for Churches of Global Outreach and Deliverance Incorporated. We have churches, uh, four churches here in Barbados. We have uh, two churches in Peru, uh, one church in Kenya, Africa, one church in um, uh, Pakistan, and three churches in Connecticut, U.S., and one church in Ohio. So we are a growing ministry, and our focus is on being an organization, a Christian organization, that enables people to see God through us. And you are here to install some new pastors, so tell me a little bit about uh, this initiative. Yeah, well, we, as we bring on new pastors under the organization, uh, we had two new pastors come here. One is with us today, uh, Pastor Deidre Boyce, and her husband, Adrian Boyce, was uh, from Building Strong Warriors in uh, Christ. We also had another pair of pastors, Pastor Sh Apostle Chantel Best, her husband, Senior Pastor Adrian Best, who are the pastors of uh, New Birth Apostolic Ministries. And so we brought them in this past uh, Saturday, uh, awesome time, wonderful time, amen. And so what we're trying to do is really uh, expand so that more people can be involved in the overall vision and purpose of the ministry of See God is to be responsible for three million people being in heaven. That's what we wanna do. And so the more that, can more that can help do that, the greater it is. So we're here to support the churches, uh, to help them, uh, to be an umbrella over them, uh, not to dictate to them, but to encourage those pastors, assist them in completing the vision that God has given them, and to achieve a vision that God has for us all, and that is to win souls. Okay, Pastor Deidre, talk to me about the connection with, with the two, how you were able to get to this place. I was connected by another senior pastor mm -hmm. here in Barbados, Pastor Shirley Griffith, and she connected me to Bishop Howard. But, you know, I searched and searched and searched and made sure this is the man I want to be with, to help win these three million souls for God. So then I was, as the baby, I was ordained and installed on Saturday, gone, the 6th. All right, tell me about what that entailed. Mm -hmm. um, you're already a pastor and when you become installed, it means that you, you're joining this organization. So installation um, is just you joining the organization that becomes your, your umbrella and you know, that's when you work together with other pastors then to achieve your goal and winning souls. All right, so Barbados is a predominantly Christian society, that's what we claim. So are the teachings behind Sea God any different? from what we usually find in maybe Anglican or Catholicism or the regular Baptist churches here in Barbados? We typically give our tenets of faith to the churches. So we have a presentation that we present for the pastors that we're interested in coming under the umbrella of See God. When they look at those tenets, they see whether or not it does align with what they believe and what their faith is. And so far, I would have to say, pretty much yes because all four of the churches have come up under see God based on what we say here's what we stand for here's what we believe amen and so we like we don't try to dictate to them but what we try to do is support them as I said so our faith is not different or Christian and I know they're struggling with you know what is a true Christian today because some people say they're Christians and they're doing all kind of things but uh, we believe in living holy we believe in, in, in that Jesus Christ died and was um, buried and was raised from the dead. We believe in the virgin birth. We believe in walking up righteous before God and we believe that the Bible is the word of God. And those are the firm attendance that we have within our uh, organization, what we believe across the world with all of our churches. Pastor Deidre, what does this, uh, what does this new installation mean for you 
and your congregants, for you and your church, the people whom you're working with to bring to the body of Christ? What it really means is like there's an extra zeal now to go out there and win those souls for God. Because as the bishop said, we are looking to win three million. So I want to be a part of winning those three million. So we are excited mm -hmm. to go out there and get those three million. Delve a little deeper into this number for me because it's, it's, it's more than cropping up now. Three million souls. Where is the figure coming from? Where does the goal that they want? When we think about it, we would like to win all the souls, but we know we cannot win all. But going out there, this is, this is our command. This is God's word, go out there and win souls for his kingdom. So we're going out there, and that figure, if we could go past three million, that would be great. But that's the target, <laughs> almost like a sales figure. Three million you have to make, anything else is gravy. All right, <laughs> just to be clear. All right, so talk to me, uh, Pastor Linda, about how things have been different for you since you were installed um, uh, with the with C God, and um, uh, you made this connection to all that they offer. Okay, um, before becoming a pastor, I was I was at a church, and we did we were doing practically we were doing sermons and Bible studies, communion things things like that. Uh, becoming installed in a way it kind of cemented my call. You know, sometimes you do things in church, but then you wonder if what your call really is. So that kind of cemented that. And then um, just meeting with other pastors um, of the same faith. So it, it is kind of strengthening. It, it builds you. It encourages you. So it, it has been a really wonderful ride. Very encouraging. And, um, you know, and it... it Sometimes many, when I sit and I, I think about it, and I realize this is something that the Lord had been showing me for a very long time. So it's kinda, it kind of has confirmed my call. So it's, it's been really good. All right, Bishop Howard, I know we took a look at how mm -hmm. things have changed since Pastor Linda has been installed. We asked Pastor Deidre how she feels uh, being installed will change you know, how she approaches, what she does with her church. But from your perspective, what does coming under the banner of Seek God mean to you in terms of being able to bring so many different churches um, kind of in line with your doctrine? Awesome, awesome question. What it does for me personally is one thing, when I started pastoring uh, 12 years ago, I told the Lord I didn't want to pastor a black church. I didn't want to be over a black organization and nothing against my color. I'm, I'm proud to be a black man, but I wanted to have a church that resembled heaven. I wanted a, 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 to pastor a, a church, an organization that resembled heaven. And if we all are going to the same place, no matter your, your race, creed or color, that's what I wanted to pastor. So. When I look at and say, okay, we have churches in Peru, churches in Barbados, churches in Africa, churches in uh, Pakistan, in the United States of America, those coming together, that's what I th thoroughly believe heaven is going to be like. People from all over the world, all nations. And so if we are going to have an organization, I want it to be a place where people can look and say, that's what heaven is going to look like. And that's the biggest motivator for me to go around the world and to other countries and minister and find churches that have the same passion, uh, the same zeal for souls. Uh, the 3,000 number comes from when we first started our church. Our vision at the Upper Room Christian Center in Connecticut is to win one million souls. Uh, 3,000 came out after conversation and they said, Bishop, uh, one, one million is not, a, not enough. We need to jack that number up. And so by the motivation of the, the, the people, so let's take it to 3 million. And so that's where we are today. But like you said, if we go beyond 3 million, that's the gravy. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about the Beijing connection because uh, we're hearing about churches across the globe. Mm -hmm. And here you are in Barbados installing pastors and kind of bringing some other people along. So how they come to be here in Bar Barbados? That's, that they rented at me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that's very interesting. Um, my family lives in Connecticut with Bishop, so we would have known each other for a very, very long time. And um, when I became a minister, 
um, under him and he decided, you know, he got the vision from God about see God and so on. So my, my husband and I, we became the first pastors here in Barbados to be installed into Sea God and under his ministry. And I, uh, when he first came here, we had gotten some pastors, which, which would have been the pastors that would have introduced Pastor Deirdre to him. We had gotten them to bring him down from the airport. So in coming down, he, I guess he got into talking with them and they, they loved the vision, they loved what he was saying and they ended up coming underneath him and then they brought her and the other pastor as well. So now we have this whole Bajan thing between um, Connecticut and Barbados just going on. And Well, I was right. right. There was no better person to yes. talk about that connection than you. Yes. <laughs> Um, so, so tell me about uh, the rest of your time here in Barbados. I would imagine that you want to would want to use it to tell people more about the organization Absolutely. and uh, get more people on board with what you're doing. Perfect. Well, I'm here with my wife, uh, Pastor Tina Daniel, and we are here for the rest of our time. We're going to be meeting. We're planning our second annual Holy Convocation uh, with the honors of being here in Barbados, this great warm country. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so what we want to do is share with people that we are here, once again, focusing on bringing the love of Jesus Christ into the uh, Barbados. We want to bring our holy convocation here in June the 30th through the uh, July the 4th. Uh, we want to get the message out about uh, the convocation coming up. We want to welcome and invite all who would love to come. We're going to be at the Savannah uh, Hotel uh, those days, e evenings at 7 o'clock p.m., sharing the gospel praising the Lord, fellowshipping, uh, bringing the churches from all around the world together here uh, as a place where we feel that Christianity faith is welcome, uh, where we feel the warmth and the love of the saints here, the people here. Uh, I love coming to Barbados. I, I really enjoy coming here. And as she said, uh, we have a, a Barbadian connection in um, Connecticut. Uh, matter of fact, the elder, uh, senior elder of our church uh, is from Barbados, is her brother, Elder Troy Herbert, and he kind of makes the connections for us, and now the ball is really rolling. So we're really here to um, express the love of God and give the, the island a world concept of Christian, that we're not just sitting here being Christians and we're just Barbadian Christians, we're U.S. Christians. We're, no, we are Christians. We're children of God. And that's from all around the world. And that's what I really focus on, Hona. And that's the message here, that we come to be people that love God and want people that love God. To, to join together. Join and together. I think that's the, the most important yes. part. Because when we think about being able to practice Christianity in this part of the world, uh, as compared to people maybe from the Asian continent, mm -hmm. Pakistanis, uh, the African continent, can be a little challenging, particularly where there are other, um, you know, there are other religions yes. that they're kind of battling against a lot of the times because that's what's happening. So, so true. again, the Holy Convocation is going to be held June 30th to July 3rd mm -hmm. at the Savannah Hotel. And, you know, how do other pastors kind of uh, feed into what you're doing and become a, a part of the entire process? Linda? Um, I'd love to be answered that. <laughs> Um, okay, so if they are interested, they can, we have, Bishop has a church page, it's the Upper Room Christian Center on Facebook. I have a page, also Upper Room Christian Center, and Pastor Deirdre also has a page, Building Strong Warriors in Christ, and um, they can go to those pages and the information should be there. It should be phone numbers on the pages that you can also call and you know, ask questions if you um, want to register for the convocation. Every, every the information should be there. But if you call or you message, then you should get all of those answers. All right, that's yes, wonderful. Please. I want to thank you so much, Bishop Howard Daniel Senior, uh -huh. Pastor Deidre Boyce. Congratulations! <laughs> you you are the baby now of the lot. <laughs> Pastor Linda Herbert. Uh, yeah. Wonderful to see you in the flesh. Yes, and of course, your son has been here a few times. I know my producer, Alicia, yeah. will be smiling big when you say his name. Mario Herbert, the author of Adrian at Large. Yep. <laughs> uh, we absolutely love that series. Yeah. So thank you for coming in and sharing. And, you know, uh, it's interesting to hear you talk about uh, the church 
welcoming everyone because yes. a lot of the times we forget mm -hmm. um, mm. that we are a whole big world. Mm -hmm. So thanks again yes. and all the best. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Right. See you. So the Holy Convocation and See God, uh, you know, they have the Holy Convocation for 2024 coming up uh, late June into July. Check out the pages. Upper Room Christian Center and you'll get further information. It's time for another break. We're going to continue the family talk after this. Uh, we have a, a series going, Family Matters, with Cornelius Bartlett. And coming up next, we're going to be uh, sitting down with him. And it's going to be a pretty interesting discussion that you won't want to miss. So stay with me. Morning, morning, morning. Good morning. Good morning to you. Tune into CBC Newsnight for the NISS Business Report, a comprehensive look at the local, regional, and international business world every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday during CBC Newsnight. Brought to you by the National Insurance and Social Security Service. More than a contribution, it's your lifeline. Every day at 7 p.m., we bring you a comprehensive news package because keeping you informed is our number one priority. Whether it's local, regional, or international stories, our commitment is to you and keeping you reliably informed. Join us every day at 7 p.m. for CBC Newsnight. The facts say Morning Barbados reaches an audience of over 50,000 and Newsnight reaches over 56,000. It's simple. When you advertise, you're getting your message to over 50,000 of your potential customers. Make the call to CBC Sales Department today and watch your business grow. Contact us at 467-5559 or email marketing at cbc.bb. From the beautiful shores of the Gem of the Caribbean, Barbados, home of the amazing Harrison's Cave, the tantalizing Oyston's Bay Garden, our historic garrison, the indigenous road tennis, and the friendliest people in the world, we are 94.7 FM, the ultimate Bajan experience. Every night, we bring you a complete look at the weather forecast. Because keeping you safe and informed is our top priority. The CBC Weather Report, brought to you by Ace Agent B Hardware, the helpful hardware. Morning, morning, morning. Good morning. Good morning to you. Eight minutes to go before the seven o'clock hour. Good Monday morning to you. Whatever you're doing, whether you're grabbing a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or what have you. You know, good to have you in company here with us. And of course, we're broadcasting live from the Standard Showroom in Wildy, where we have been for quite some time. And of course, we'd love to hear from you as well. Whatever is happening with you, uh, if there's something in the community or someone you think that we should know about or you want to share, this is all about you. It's community television. It's all about what you're doing and sharing what's happening here in Barbados and indeed across the diaspora. Now, over the last couple of weeks, we have been doing a series called Family Matters with Cornelius Bartlett. And this morning, we're going to be taking a look at divorce, the big D word. Good morning, Cornelius. How are you doing? Good morning. I'm great. Glad to be here. I don't think I've seen you since Easter. How was your Easter? It was excellent. Too short, though. Yeah? Because I worked so hard during the week that, you know, when I get a long weekend, I always want more. You said too short. Yeah. It was a four-day weekend. I only remembered one. <laughs> I, only I hope one. that was Easter Sunday. I can't even remember which one it was. <laughs> but it Not Good Friday? I can't remember. Okay. <laughs> so far. Every day is so distinctly different. I just had to keep up on which day it was that I had to eat fish. 
and then when we never mind <laughs> yeah but today we're looking at divorce which uh can be a, a, a really touchy subject uh so let's start at the very beginning um you know at what at what point do you think people decide and i guess people will say this will vary as you go from person to person but what are some of the major reasons that people are saying this is the end of the road for me. I know in recent times we've heard more and seen more surveys um, that have said, you know, there are far more divorces now than there have been in the past. Mm -hmm. So what's causing this? Okay, let's, uh, this is such a big topic. Let's start at the beginning. And I don't want to start in the middle. Now, I want to make a separation between cause and reason. Um, cause is what we refer to as, like a person might say, my husband was cheating and my wife was cheating. That's, that's a cause. The reason is a lot deeper, always. So the reason might be trauma from childhood, low self-esteem, um, not feeling um, validated within, you know, within yourself. Now, in terms of um, divorce, you cannot speak divorce unless you look at marriage. Now, way too many people are getting married in a state of unconsciousness. In other words, a lot of people are getting married for the wrong reasons. A lot of people are getting married for, for um, the wrong agendas. And maybe we can go, go into that, but I don't want us to make this particular, um, give the, I don't want to give you a shallow answer, because it's a lot deeper than just um, what we see on the surface. People are getting divorced for a lot of frivolous reasons. And I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be real candid with you in terms of my research and, and dealing with, with family matters. People are getting divorced for a lot of frivolous reasons. It is almost like, and I hope nobody feels insulted, but if you do, maybe you need to. But it feels sometimes as though a lot of children are getting married and not adults. When I look at the reasons and, and, and some of the things that people divorce over. Children and not adults. So you think people aren't prepared for marriage uh, because research says that people are getting married later. So you're saying getting married later in life, but not necessarily at the maturity that the level of maturity that they need to be able to follow on with the with the relationships. Again, you know, a lot of times we are, you know, have a same monkey handling gun. Oh. We have a lot of monkeys silent gun when it comes to marriage. Uh, we can't escape. You know, people sometimes get a little nervous when you talk about God. So let's talk God. God is the one who created marriage, huh? And God has particular rules in the manual as to how marriage is supposed to work. And you have persons who are coming into marriage, and they have all sorts of movie concepts as to what marriage. I'm supposed, my husband is supposed to make me happy. My wife is supposed to make me happy. Um, some people come into marriage because um, of financial reasons. Some people come into marriage because they think that they look good. They would look good. Or some people just want to wear a wedding dress or a man want to see how nice he looks in a suit um, or whatever. The point in matter is that the, you know they have a saying that says you can't end right if you start wrong. And I, I think that a lot of people aren't coming into marriage with the right reasoning and the right understanding. And I like to, I like to describe, and sorry for doing this, but I like to describe marriage uh, almost like a game. And you know in cricket and football you have rules. You cannot play football with cricket rules or vice versa. And I think that if we were to look at a lot of people that are married and, and the reason um, they're getting married, we will see that they're getting married with a lot of frivolous reasons or frivolous motives for getting married. They do not understand what marriage is about. They do not understand the rules of engagement in marriage. So therefore they mess it up. So what do you deem frivolous um, when we look at, at marriage? Because this will all be relative. Because what one person might see as frivolous, other people will not. I think all of this really is guided by what I like to call your deal breakers in a relationship. So a lot of people, you're right, they get into relationships and follow through with marriage without truly knowing what their deal breakers are. Um, so talk to me a little bit more about uh, what you consider to be frivolous in the, the grand scheme of things. Okay, I, I, I want to change the word from frivolous and, and say um, 
um, shallow, right? Because I don't want, I don't want to mislead um, anyone in terms of the, the, the heart and root of what I believe um, is, is, the, is, the, is the problem here. So I, I think it is shallow. Um, and you talk about deal breakers. Here, here, here's what really gets me when I listen to people. All the people out there, that, or most of them that I hear that are not married, when they talk about the possibility of getting married, they talk about finding Mr. Right or Miss Right. Now, I have a, I have a question I want to ask. You want Miss Right or Mr. Right? When you find Miss Right or Mr. Right, and you have not worked on yourself, so you are not Miss Right or Miss Right either. So you find Miss Right or Mr. Right, and then you bring your messed up self to Miss Right or Mr. Right. What's going to happen? One of the things about marriage, and as we're talking divorce, we have to talk marriage before we talk about divorce. One of the sad things about it is that marriage is one of those things that it takes two to make it work, but it only requires one to destroy it. And the extent to which you have a lot of damaged people, uh, people who are still struggling with their own personal traumas, the extent to which you have those persons joining themselves to others who may be less traumatized, less damaged, because we all, I believe we all have damage and we all have traumas. But the point of the matter is that these traumas or the damage that we have is not really the issue. The issue is when we don't recognize that we have them. And if we don't recognize that we have them, we're not going to work on them. So you have a lot of people who, look, if two people get married today and both persons recognize that, you know, I have some work to do. You work together on building that marriage. You come in there with the rules from God. You kind of pour into each other. You build each other up. And over the years, you see two people can build something really beautiful. In other words, you should be more in love with your husband and your husband should be more in love with you now than 20 years later than when you first got married. But what you find is that people, because they don't understand the rules of engagement, they do not, they do not come to the marriage, as, it, as they would say, with clean hands, with all these ulterior motives. They come with their damage. They want you to be perfect, but they're not perfect. They want you to be Mr. Right and Mr. Right, but they're not Mr. Right or Mr. Right. And then you have a, the scale way off balance and this disparity in, in the relationships. And then somebody gets disenchant disenchanted and decide they want out. You have issues of domestic violence. You have issues of infidelity. Those are just really, re really causes, but the reasons are a lot deeper. All right. I'm even more confused than when you started. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Let, let, but we know, it's a, we know it's a big big topic and when we talk about matters of the heart um, you know it can take us in interesting places so what are your suggestions for people who might be married to make sure that the vows that they say in front of God and their friends and relatives mm -hmm. hold true uh, for staying together through thick and thin mm -hmm. uh, come what may for years to come okay two things that I would want to enlarge in bold print capital letters. Before you think of getting married, get to know yourself. In other words, if you're listening to me now, sit down and say, well, I have a wedding plan in six months or even three months. There's nothing wrong with calling it off. It's better to call the wedding off and be ready than to jump in and then have destruction that may not only involve you and your husband, but years down the line, it may involve innocent children. So one is to get to know yourself. Two, and I cannot emphasize this enough, I don't care if you're a church goer, I don't care if you're, you're, you're a, a whatever, get counseling. Really, really get counseling. There are lots of great counselors out there. There are lots of people out there trained in counseling. Get counseling. And the reason I say get counseling, I remember when I was getting married many years ago, um, I did counseling. And, and, and the reason why... Counseling stands out to me as a major benefit is that the counselor said, made a statement to me and my fiance at the time. In counseling, what they try to do is look at value systems and see if how similar your value systems are or how different they are. And I remember um, the counselor said, if you, for example, believe that a woman should stay home barefoot and pregnant, if the man believes that, and the woman believes that, then you don't have a problem. It is when the man believes that the woman should stay home barefoot and pregnant, but the woman does not believe that, then you have a serious problem at the beginning. So I remember that 
that, that particular example as one of the, if not the penultimate reason for me as to why you should get counseling. Counseling will, will help you to work things out and understanding if this thing is likely to work or not to work. There, there are no guarantees. People change their mind. People get influenced by all sorts of things along the way. But the point of the matter is that they have a, have a saying that says you want to start with a plus. You don't want to start with a minus. So get counseling. So that's the two. Get to know yourself and get some solid counseling before. So if you've already made plans and you haven't done either of the two, call that wedding off. I know you may not listen to what I'm saying or you may not obey what I'm saying, but I want to advise you if you haven't done those two, call that wedding off. In my area of dealing with families and being a family advocate, it is painful to see the amount of damage and injury. Marriage is one of those things that was made to, like, sticking two pieces of paper together. And when you talk about divorce, it's like ripping those two pieces of paper that were well sealed with glue apart. What, what you find happens is that each part gets damaged. And may God help us when children are involved. A lot of the reasons we have a lot of this damage in our society and all the things that we're spending all this money on, building prisons and courts and all that, it starts in families. And, 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 and let me, before I, I, I shout out, let me say this. Uh, uh, um, families, and uh, when we talk about marriage, there are some people, for example, that have common law relationships where they are having children and all that. I would want to include those in terms of staying together. Because when people hear us speak about marriage, they say, well, I'm not married. You know, I live in this house with this woman for the last 30 years. That includes you. Okay. We need to keep it together for our families and for our future. All right. Well, thank you. Pretty interesting discussion. Um, you know, divorce is one of those things and marriage that you could talk about for years and years to come. So... You know, I, I don't purport to be any expert at all. But what I'll say is one thing that stayed with me through the years is I went to a, a wedding and the bride's mother, she did a list <laughs> of things that, sh that the bride should expect of her husband and what the husband should expect of his wife. And I found that very interesting because I don't think people do that. It was literally a list of... Um, you know, what will be expected down to sharing uh, the work of the home <laughs> and washing dishes and all of this. And everybody found it hilarious, but I, I thought it was quite necessary, not to necessarily come from the mother of the bride, but to be between the two. All right, so it's time for another break. I want to thank you so much for coming in, Cornelius. Definitely some food for thought as we move through this week. So thanks for coming in. Pleasure. Thank you. All right, always good to have you here. Always provocative, always, always provocative. <laughs> We're going to take another break. Uh, coming up, we have the news coming your way. It's just after 7 o'clock, 7 minutes after 7. So we're going to update you on the news. And then we still have Stephen Leslie to come through. We're talking about the BCA season, uh, the upcoming season. I believe it starts today, yes, yeah, Stephen? Yesterday. Started yesterday? Oh, great. Started yesterday. And uh, so we're going to talk about that. Plus, we have a very interesting feature coming up with amputee, entrepreneur, and content creator, Jason Green. He's going to be here with us on Morning Barbados, so do stay tuned. Morning, morning, morning. Good morning. Good morning to you. Every day at 7 p.m., we bring you a comprehensive news package because keeping you informed is our number one priority. Whether it's local, regional, or international stories, our commitment is to you and keeping you reliably informed. Join us every day at 7 p.m. for CBC Newsnight.
The facts say Morning Barbados reaches an audience of over 50,000 and Newsnight reaches over 56,000. It's simple. When you advertise, you're getting your message to over 50,000 of your potential customers. Make the call to CBC Sales Department today and watch your business grow. Contact us at 467-5559 or email marketing at cbc.bb. From the beautiful shores of the Gem of the Caribbean, Barbados, home of the amazing Harrison's Cave, the tantalizing Oyston's Bay Garden, our historic garrison, the indigenous road tennis, and the friendliest people in the world, we are 94.7 FM, the ultimate Bajan experience. Every night, we bring you a complete look at the weather forecast. Because keeping you safe and informed is our top priority. The CBC Weather Report, brought to you by Ace Agent B Hardware, the helpful hardware. Morning Barbados is on the move and we're coming to you every weekday morning from right here at the Standard Showroom in Wildy. Now, together, we're giving you an opportunity to win. All you have to do is submit a photo of that room that you want to see changed in a fantastic way. And the interior design curator here at Standard and all of their experts are going to get together and select the room that needs the most work. It just might be yours. All you have to do is submit your photo to info at standard.bb and you could be here with us saying, Morning Barbados, look at my beautiful space. Morning, morning, morning. Good morning. Good morning to you. Good morning to you on this April 8th. It's time now for an update of the news here on Morning Barbados. The Boy Scouts Association of Barbados is aiming to increase its membership after a significant drop during the COVID-19 pandemic. The association has been trying various ways to boost its numbers and the interest of children in becoming scouts. It held its second annual fun day in Queen's Park, which attracted more than 500 people. Chairman of the Fun Day Committee, Jason King, says there are some other things in place to attract both youth and adults. A few new beaver colonies that are coming into being. And once the boys are in beavers and are attracted to the program, we then move them on to cubs. There are also some schools and groups that don't have um, a beaver section and they only start at cubs. We're making sure now that once they reach that cub section, which is seven to 10 and a half slash 11 years old, that there's a scout group that they can go to. They may not be a scout group as part of scout troop as part of their particular group, but we're trying to partner certain or channel certain cub packs to have their boys go to certain troops. Barbados says the Boy Scout, Mr. King says the Boy Scouts Association has been in discussions with the Barbados Defense Force and Barbados Cadet Corps on how to be, become better prepared for people to join the force. We have lost some of the Cub Scouts to the Cadet Corps, but we have also been having discussions with the Barbados Defense Force and the Barbados Cadet Corps so that because it's a partnership. So if we are preparing them to go either to scouts or to cadets, they are still making themselves important and, and key members to Barbados' future. Since establishing the Ministry of Industry, Innovation, Science and Technology, Barbados is still seeking to recruit the right mix of personnel to fill critical vacant posts. This was revealed by Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Industry, Innovation, Science and Technology, Marva Howell. She was participating in the fourth meeting of the Economic Cooperation on Latin America and the Caribbean Conference on Science, Innovation and ICT in Colombia. The aging population and skills deficit in the areas of science and technology, where possible, we have sought to contract professionals from other countries who have the expertise and exper experience to fill vacancies and to work with locals with the intention of transferring skills and knowledge through training, coaching and mentoring. 
Over 60 businesses have been created from 15 different participating schools in this year's Barbados Entrepreneurship Foundation $20 Challenge. Businesses were set up across nine categories, but in the end, the top three were food and beverage with 46%, while arts and crafts produced 14%, and jewelry, 11%. Speaking at the awards ceremony, executive chairperson of the entire group, Celeste Foster, stated that this year was different to others, but very rewarding. Once again, we had a three to one ratio of female to males in the challenge. However, the makeup of the finalists top 10 teams tells a different story. <laughs> For the first time in our history, we have more males than females comprising the top 10. Eleven males representing 61% of the finalists. This is very encouraging. Also speaking at the award ceremony was manager of Scotiabank Haggard Hall branch, Ryan Carrington. He stated that challenges such as these are beneficial for shaping this and the next generation of entrepreneurs. Youth entrepreneurship stands as a beacon of employment and transformation holding the potential to shape the future in profound ways. It is a crucial driving force for innovation, fostering skill development, and empowering the next generation. I believe that it is a hotbed for cultivating fresh ideas and innovative solutions. As we have seen firsthand with the $20 challenge, young entrepreneurs often bring a unique perspective to the table and their enthusiasm and creativity contribute to a culture of continuous innovation. In sports, top Barbados sprinter Shade Williams has won yet another international 200 meters as she prepares for the Paris Olympics. Saturday, Williams won the women's 200 at the Miramar Invitational in Florida after Jamaica's two-time reigning world champion Sharika Jackson pulled out, delaying the start to her season for a third time in Jackson's absence, two-time world bronze medalist Williams of Barbados took victory in 22-82. So here we go, women's 200. And here we the go. Inside, the inside, go-go flannel battle, Williams and Karstock. Shawnee Williams looks good on the inside, but battle now responding on the inside. Into the main straightaway here, our final race in Miramar. Flannel, but now out there is Williams, and Williams appears to get the victory in lane number six. It was sort of a casual result there at the end, 22-82, kind of a casual run. The top place sprinting at 200 meters. Marstock gets dragged to second alongside Williams in 23-01, and Flannel Faded a little bit there in the last 50 meters or so. We'll wind up in third in 23:31. And that's it for an update of news at this time. Remember, stay tuned for Newsday at 12 noon here on TV8, or you can tune in to our sister stations Q100.7 FM, 98.1 The One, and 94.7 FM for the CBC News World at One. Also, follow us on socials everywhere. It's time to take a break. Just about 18 minutes after 7 o'clock, Morning Barbados will return after this. Morning, morning, morning. Good morning. Good morning to you. Tune in to CBC Newsnight for the NISS Business Report. A comprehensive look at the local, regional and international business world every Monday, Wednesday and Friday during CBC Newsnight. Brought to you by the National Insurance and Social Security Service. More than a contribution, it's your lifeline. Every day at 7 p.m., we bring you a comprehensive news package because keeping you informed is our number one priority. 
Whether it's local, regional, or international stories, our commitment is to you and keeping you reliably informed. Join us every day at 7 p.m. for CBC Newsnight. The facts say Morning Barbados reaches an audience of over 50,000 and Newsnight reaches over 56,000. It's simple. When you advertise, you're getting your message to over 50,000 of your potential customers. Make the call to CBC Sales Department today and watch your business grow. Contact us at 467-5559 or email marketing at cbc.bb. From the beautiful shores of the Gem of the Caribbean, Barbados, home of the amazing Harrison's Cave, the tantalizing Oyston's Bay Garden, our historic garrison, the indigenous road tennis, and the friendliest people in the world. We are 94.7 FM, the ultimate Bajan experience. Every night, we bring you a complete look at the weather forecast. Because keeping you safe and informed is our top priority. The CBC Weather Report, brought to you by Ace Agent B Hardware, the helpful hardware. Morning Barbados is on the move and we're coming to you every weekday morning from right here at the Standard Showroom in Wildy. Now, together, we're giving you an opportunity to win. All you have to do is submit a photo of that room that you want to see changed in a fantastic way. And the interior design curator here at Standard and all of their experts are going to get together and select the room that needs the most work. It just might be yours. All you have to do is submit your photo to info at standard.bb and you could be here with us saying, Morning Barbados, look at my beautiful space. Tune into CBC Newsnight for the NISS Business Report. A comprehensive look at the local, regional, and international business world every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday during CBC Newsnight. Brought to you by the National Insurance and Social Security Service. More than a contribution, it's your lifeline. Every day at 7 p.m., we bring you a comprehensive news package because keeping you informed is our number one priority. Whether it's local, regional, or international stories, our commitment is to you and keeping you reliably informed. Join us every day at 7 p.m. for CBC Newsnight. Welcome back to Morning Barbados. So spot, but another interesting discussion is coming up as I'm joined around the table by Stephen Leslie, Marketing and Communications Manager with the Barbados Cricket Association. Good morning to you, Stephen. Morning, Tisha. I hope you had a good weekend. I did. I know you had a great weekend for sure with BCA cricketing season getting started yesterday. Yes, talk to me about, about that launch and all we can expect for 2024. But just before cricket began yesterday, April 7th, I was part of a contingent that greeted the national on the 15th side who came back from Antigua as regional on the 15th champions. And that was Thursday night. Grandy Adams International Airport was transformed. We had grandparents, cousins, aunts, parents, the, the whole atmosphere to welcome back DeMarco Wiggins and the regional on the 15th champions. So we want to commend them for doing well again. Barbados has a very strong tradition at regional level, but those young men who went to Antigua, new arrangement, head coach, manager, assistant coach, physio, and they did Barbados proud. So just before 
we gone into the local season we wanted to commend those young under 15 players yes the 2020 has been in 1892 so that's some hundred and that we've been doing it and we started with the t20 component we had a number of games all over the island and t i visited two venues wildy where there was an expectation for barbadian born joffre archer to have been part of that wildy side he didn't play in that particular game but you saw Many spectators, I mean, both local and overseas, who came anticipating to see Joffrey. And we do hope that he'll be able to start and play very shortly. But along with Wildy, I visited Queen's Park. Again, a very exciting game between Spartan and Pitwick. So the season has started very well, and we're looking forward to lots of excitement during the course of the next few months. All right, let's talk a, li a little bit more about uh, the number of clubs and teams that will be participating in the season. I know for Barbadians, uh, most of us are cricket enthusiasts for one reason or the other, whether it's because, like you said, we have children, our grandchildren, nieces, nephews playing. We're all very, very invested in the cricket. Tisha, there was a, a post yesterday by Joe Manning, uh, a public figure, you know, does a lot of sports work. He said, today, over 550 men will be happy that they'll be able to leave home because they're playing cricket. <laughs> so when you talk about this, they are also playing local cricket, but predominantly the males are there and members there are over 50 clubs and uh, they've got different teams broken down. And then we've got the 20 secondary schools in Barbados, so they all are represented. So we've got many players who are on the field of play. And I would like to remind Barbados, we, we host at least... 1200 matches per year so in the months of april to december 1200 organized matches and it's a wonderful feeling that when you go to play these games that clubs have the pride schools have the pride and they're a rich tradition you know there's some clubs and schools who have won more championships than others but everything everyone is really competitive and it's something we look forward to every year at the Barbados Cricket Association. Stephen, tell me, tell me what it takes to be able to pull this off. You said over 1,200 or thereabouts matches uh, throughout the season. This by no means is a an easy feat, particularly when you think about the various divisions and so many schools involved, just generally so many people involved. So let's talk about what it takes to be able to deliver on a BCA cricket in season. Well, it takes a lot of attention to detail. I can say, like, back in 2016, we embarked on playing the T20 format first. Um, I was, at that point, director of cricket, made the suggestion to the Joe Garner-led board, and they accepted. So we start with the T20. It's been maintained over the last decade or so. So then you go from T20 cricket into 50-over cricket, which is another form of limited overs. Then you go into the traditional three-day cricket. Now, the three-day cricket is where teams are either promoted or relegated. And when you think about the logistics, you've got schools where the venues are not ideal. At Sometimes some clubs where the, the venues are not ideal. There's always a challenge with covers, because if you have covers where you can cover the pitch, but not the run-ups if it rains. So when you're looking at all those logistics, you have to try to work through details with clubs and schools and one of the key things i believe is your ability to understand the dynamics because urban grounds are different to rural grounds and you find that there are some teams that have very strong community following so you want to be able to make them as comfortable when you're playing so all in all to keep it very simple you have to have attention to detail and you must understand the dynamics in terms of having these 1200 plus games played every year I will imagine, I would imagine of equal importance is the lead up to the season in terms of how the cricketers themselves, the participants are being prepared for the season. What's that like and uh, how does the BCA engage with the clubs, the schools and so on to make sure that they truly are getting the cricketers ready so you have the best possible season? Well, a typical week leading into the season, most clubs and schools practice three days a week. So it's typically Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday um, because of the restriction will like most sessions start about three o'clock in the afternoon and go until about six but the bca's involvement has been you know tremendous i mean we've been giving clubs balls to play with in the last maybe decade or so so they don't have that expense of thinking that a cricket ball is at least 45 to 50 dollars per ball so you that's taken away we also pay the fees for the cricket umpires association so when you're playing a game tisha on the weekend you're looking at the fact that you you got to pay the umpires fee that was something in the past so the 
BC has taken that away. And then what we've done in recent years as well is that we supply all of the, the apparel and the clothing for these teams to play in. So there's the color clothing, which we use for the limited overs format when you're using a white cricket ball. And then there's the white apparel that you use when you're using the red cricket ball. So again, the BC has come on board, engaged a company by the name of Stonehill, and we've been supplying those, those apparel for teams throughout the, the, the entire competition. So all in all, we've taken away those three things, but we do work with, with clubs and schools if there's some challenges and maybe the grass is growing a bit too high we can supply a weed whacker from time to time to help them but typically it is a communication because if you're at a club and something is needed you need to communicate with the bc and we we'll respond as efficiently as we can well it, it, it it's always impressive to see the guys out in their various colors representing their clubs or schools as the case may be, and I know you are spearheading it at the Barbados Cricket Association, but it also calls for a lot of support from many sponsors from corporate Barbados and otherwise, so I'm sure you'd want to give kudos to them as well. Yeah, I mean, you, you could understand the dynamics of, you know, the expense covering a cricket season. We've got uh, like three or four main sponsors that have come on board. IGT Global Services have been really good to us over maybe just about two decades or so, and they continue to support us. And then we've got some other companies that have come on board. Signia Glow Financial Inc., for example, they support strongly the youth cricket that we have. And then we've got another entity there, which is the Barbados Public Workers Cooperative Credit Union Limited. They've come on board with the youth cricket again. So we've got many other stakeholders who've worked with the BCA over the years, but we're talking about the current ones who are with us. And we, we continue to work with a system that we want to encourage persons to come on board because... Ultimately, if you stabilize your grassroots cricket, which is school's cricket pretty much, and you go from there, you go into the clubs, they go to the national teams, and then, as you and I would experience, the international arena. So it's important that that support is there, and the sponsors are welcome to join us as we continue this journey. I think it's important for people to remember that you guys at the BCA really live cricket every single day, and it's reassuring to know that you've all been a part of cricket. Uh, some of you in front of the ball, behind the ball, others in the bleachers. For you, you've been a player. Uh, you've kind of come through the ranks, so you really can appreciate all that's happening. I won't ask you what's your favorite team that's tipped to win, because I know you can't say any such thing. But uh, I will be looking out for you at the various um, places as we continue throughout the season. So uh, best wishes to you and best wishes indeed to all the teams. And the one thing this year, we are hosting Cricket World Cup in June. So BCA has determined that local cricket will continue when those thousands of visitors descend on the island in the month of June. So they won't just be seeing World Cup cricket, but they'll see some high class local cricket as well. And we do hope that this year will be a, a total success. I love it. Cricket at every corner. Every corner. I love it. I love it. Coming out of Grantley Adams International Airport and passing a match, there's nothing like it. So uh, talking to Stephen Leslie, Marketing and Communications Manager with the Barbados Cricket Association about the local cricket season that got started yesterday. All right, look out for all that's coming up and I'm sure it will be coming to your community soon. Thanks, Stephen. It's been a pleasure. Always good to see you and a big shout out to everybody at the BCA. Maybe I know a little bit too much about the BCA. I know everybody. <laughs> All right, so it's time for another break. When we come back, a very interesting feature is coming up. So stay with us. Morning, morning, morning. Good morning. Good morning to you. Morning Barbados is on the move and we're coming to you every weekday morning from right here at the Standard Showroom in Wildy. Now, together, we're giving you an opportunity to win. All you have to do is submit a photo of that room that you want to see changed in a fantastic way. And the interior design curator here at Standard and all of their experts are going to get together and select the room that needs the most yours. All you have to do is yes, I can. submit your next time wait for me. info at standard.bb and wait for me. here with us saying, Morning Barbados, look at my beautiful space. 
Tune in to CBC Newsnight for the NISS Business Report, a comprehensive look at the local, regional, and international business world every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday during CBC Newsnight. Brought to you by the National Insurance and Social Security Service. More than a contribution, it's your lifeline. Every day at 7 p.m., we bring you a comprehensive news package because keeping you informed is our number one priority. Whether it's local, regional, or international stories, our commitment is to you and keeping you reliably informed. Join us every day at 7 p.m. for CBC Newsnight. The facts say Morning Barbados reaches an audience of over 50,000 and Newsnight reaches over 56,000. It's simple. When you advertise, you're getting your message to over 50,000 of your potential customers. Make the call to CBC Sales Department today and watch your business grow. Contact us at 467-5559 or email marketing at cbc.bb. From the beautiful shores of the Gem of the Caribbean, Barbados, home of the amazing Harrison's Cave, the tantalizing Oyston's Bay Garden, our historic garrison, the indigenous road tennis, and the friendliest people in the world, we are 94.7 FM, the ultimate Bajan experience. Every night, we bring you a complete look at the weather forecast. Because keeping you safe and informed is our top priority. The CBC Weather Report, brought to you by Ace Agent B Hardware, the helpful hardware. Morning Barbados is on the move and we're coming to you every weekday morning from right here at the Standard Showroom in Wilby. Now, together, we're giving you an opportunity to win. All you have to do is submit a photo of that room that you want to see changed in a fantastic way. And the interior design curator here at Standard and all of their experts are going to get together and select the room that needs the most work. It just might be yours. All you have to do is submit your photo to info at standard.bb and you could be here with us saying, Morning Barbados, look at my beautiful space. Tune in to CBC Newsnight for the NISS Business Report, a comprehensive look at the local, regional, and international business world every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday during CBC Newsnight. Brought to you by the National Insurance and Social Security Service. More than a contribution, it's your lifeline. Morning, morning, morning. Good morning indeed and welcome back. Just about 23 minutes now before the 8 o'clock hour. So we've been telling you about amazing things all morning long. And this time it's no different. Uh, help me welcome to Morning Barbados, Mikhail Besson, who is Guild President at the UWI Cafil Campus. Good to have you with us. You and, and I was fretting, Mikhail, that his name is on his shirt. <laughs> 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 it's wonderful to have you here with us. Thanks. He's accompanied by Professor Winston Moore, Deputy Principal, the UWE Cayville Campus. Good to have you with us. Good morning. Good morning. And joining us online is Shimon McIntosh, who's Managing Director of RBC Royal Bank Barbados and Area Vice President, Business Banking, RBC Royal Bank Barbados. So welcome virtually. We're going to bring you into the conversation as well. Uh, we want to tell you about this wonderful initiative called RBC Race for the Kids. It's an initiative of the bank, but what they're doing is working toward supporting many of the initiatives that are happening at the University of the West Indies. So if I can start with you, Shimon, I'm wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about this initiative and how important it is for the bank to be able to engage with the community whom you serve, but not only that, to be able to work specifically with children. 
thank you for that and good morning again and thank good you morning. very much for having me on the program. Uh, just to step back a little bit, the RBC race for kids has its origin as a single race in New York in 2009 and since then it has taken off into a series of events that occur across the world. Uh, the race for the kids has always been about uplifting others, creating opportunities for youth and opening doors for the future. And in keeping with that purpose, we are proud in Barbados to support youth and education. And we have our valued partnership with the University of the West Indies Cave Hill Campus. And we support the UE Cave Hill Campus by providing scholarships and also funding to the first year experience program. Uh, so in Barbados, our BC Race for Kids first started in 2017. Uh, this year will be our uh, eighth edition of the race. And, you know, following COVID, last year was our first return to in-person format. The response was great, and we're looking to build further on that. Uh, since then, we raised $586,700 uh, to, to the UE Cable uh, campus, uh, awarding over 69 scholarships and 170000 to the First Year Experience Program. That is a lot of work. Uh, for you, <laughs> Professor Moore, talk to me about what it means to be able to help students at the University of the West Indies through initiatives like this one. And in particular, uh, Mr. McIntosh talked about being able to, to help a lot of first-year students. So we know mm -hmm. a lot of the times that's where we need the help. Yeah. So there are two main initiatives I'd I like to speak about. The First Year Experience Program and then the Student Hardship and Emergency Fund. So the first year experience program is, is a really great initiative. It helps students to acclimatize to the university experience. So many of our students come from secondary schools, they come from community colleges, and university is, is a really new experience. They are left on their own to figure out how to register for classes, how to make new friends in this new environment, and lectures are very different from being at school when you have to go to class. People tell you when you have to go to class. At university, you know, we, you give, we give you their schedule and then you have to figure out how to get to the classes and you have to figure out, you know, how to maneuver between classes. So the first year experience helps students with that um, acclimatization process. It gives you a, a peer mentor as well. So you have someone who has went through this process already in previous years and helps them to, uh, you know, know the ropes, uh, get accustomed to being at the University of West Indies. It's been a very successful program. Students have um, told other students about the program as well, and it's something that really that we think uh, really uh, enables student success. The the one, the other program that falls under my portfolio is the Student Hardship and Emergency Fund. And, you know, many people think that because Barbadian students are funded by the government of Barbados that there no longer is a need for financial assistance. But you'll be surprised that many students go through very difficult times while they're studying at the university. I've had situations where um, students experience the death of one or two, uh, two parents. And imagine studying for your degree when you, your, your main breadwinner in the household is no longer there. And that's what the Student Hardship and Emergency Fund is about. It provides support to those students. Uh, it helps them um, pay for books, even something simple as um, uh, traveling to university on a day-to-day -day basis as well. It, we provide support for that. And also for our um, non-Barbadian students, that emergency fund can also be very useful for them because they're, they're no longer in the um, support of their family. They're away from home and they're with, in a new culture. So therefore, that emergency fund can be very useful for them. Absolutely. Now, Mikkel, as president of the Guild of Students, I'm sure you could speak firsthand about your engagement with students and how programs like this one are able to help. Yes, most definitely. Um, at the Guild, we have our welfare program um, and scholarships as well that we distribute as the Guild. Um, you know, it's open for a particular time. We have so many applicants, again, as Professor Moore would have said earlier, um, for different reasons. Sometimes it's just, you know, financial assistance to either pay tuition or maybe things at home aren't what they usually, um, what they would be for, so that, you know, students could actually have access to, to something to help. Um, and as a regional student, you know, as Professor Moore said earlier, the culture shock, um, Barbados is a bit more, you know, on the pricier side of life, <laughs> um, coming from Trinidad and Tobago. 
Um, so it's definitely great to know that you have a contingency plan, something to fall back on that the university could assist. Um, and this particular RBC project, you know, it, because it's definitely something that the guild and the student population definitely supports. Sure. Absolutely. Now, Mr. McIntosh, I, I know that uh, there used to be a bank in close proximity to the University of the West Indies, and I would imagine that that made for a good connection. But even though you're no longer there, I could see why an initiative like this would really bring students and lecturers on board alike. So let's talk about the race itself that's coming up on April 14th. Yeah, so on April 14th this year, we're bringing the race uh, starting from the UK Hill campus. Last year, we, we started at the Chelston RBC branch, but this year we're coming back to UK Hill on the April 14th at 4 p.m. Starting at UK Hill, we're going to head out right, head up the hill, uh, and then we're going to go around Wanstead Terrace and come back to, to the university. Uh, the exact route is on our race roster. You can go to www com, and you can get all the race details and register there. As I said, we're building a lot of momentum and we're looking forward to having a really, really great turnout. So invite your friends, invite your family. I'm calling all the UE alumni, RBCers, and, and to all of Barbados. Really looking forward to your support. Come and support an initiative to help youth education. Outside of helping youth education, I would imagine that this initiative builds lots of momentum as well inside of your organization. So let's talk about how gung-ho uh, everyone at RBC is about this initiative, considering all that you're able to do. Yeah, so definitely we're gung-ho. The RACE provides a platform that engages our employees, allows them to get involved and give back to the community. Um, and that's why employees champion the cause and volunteer their time in the days leading up to race and in preparation, getting people to come out, and also on race day as uh, stewards on, on the day. I mean, our employees are our ambassadors. They represent our values and who we are as a company. And as I mentioned, of our uh, purpose is to really help our communities prosper, and our staff and our employees are really dedicated to that. And I want to thank them for their dedication and commitment as well. Absolutely. Now talk to us Professor, more a little bit more about the registration, the collection points, and the dates and stuff like that, so that everybody can move toward getting involved. Yes, so the registration, as Shimon would have mentioned, you can register online, but we've made it very convenient for you to register in person as well. So, given that it's the RBC race for the kids. You would imagine that you can collect from a, a number of RBC locations. So there are two locations that you can collect from. Um, one is in Charleston Park, and you can collect any time between the you know, traditional banking hours, 9 to 3 p.m. And then you can also collect from RBC Lanterns uh, Mall as well, between the same um, hours of 9 to 3 p.m. At the UWI, you can collect from our bookshop between 10 and, and 3 p.m. every day up until race day. And the race day is this Sunday, so you have to get, you have to be registered between now and Saturday. Don't delay. Say don't, that again for the people in the back. The race this day Sunday. is this Sunday. <laughs> I, I, I know sometimes when you say 14th, people think, oh, that's a long time away. No, that is this Sunday. So you have to be registered between now and Saturday. Um, the registration fee is very minimal, just $35, and it gives you a full race kit. Um, and half of that for students, um, sorry, for kids, $15. So um, get registered uh, at the locations that we mentioned, Charleston Park, Lanterns Mall, and the UWI Bookshop. All right, how are the students gearing up for this, knowing that RBC is really pouring into the University of the West Indies through this initiative? Definitely excited. I must admit that, you know, the students, uh, this is not something new to us. Last year, we participated. We showed up. We showed out. Um, this year, we are definitely hoping for a lot more participation from the students. You know, last year, we were a little bit hesitant coming out of COVID. But this year, we have no excuse. So we're definitely coming out. Um, I know for certain students from the Faculty of Sport are excited um, not only to participate, but compete. Yeah, so students are excited. All right, Mr. McIntosh, I certainly hope that you will be on island for the presentation. Uh, I, and we're looking forward to you in that full race kit that the professor was talking about. Mm -hmm. not, not only would I be on island, but I'll be running as well, as I usually do. <laughs> <laughs> so looking forward to, to this Sunday, April 14th. Uh, you can also register starting today at, at UE Broad Street. 
Um, and again, I just really want to encourage everyone to come out. Education is one of the key differentiators. That's how we really, you know, help uh, people realize their full potential. Come out and support a good cause. So really, really looking forward to it and excited about Sunday. That's absolutely true. It truly is a game changer when you can help a student who wants to do well but might not have the means to. So congratulations to RBC on such an amazing initiative. Uh, RBC Race for the Kids again this Sunday. this Sunday. Let's repeat those places where this they can Sunday. head out so for registration. UWI Bookshop at the UWI Cafo Campus, the um, RBC Charleston Park, and RBC Lanterns Mall. And I think Shimon also mentioned that from today. UWI in, in Broad Street. Broad Street as well. Absolutely. Final word for you, Mr. MD, uh, in encouraging people to come out, maybe to see if they can compete with you a little bit on the road. <laughs> Listen, I, I want everyone to come out. Come out in your blue. We look into paint. Um, you even a sea of blue on Sunday. Um, and really, really want to bring, uh, you know, special highlights to this cause. It's a great cause. Looking out for everybody to come out in their numbers. So see you on Sunday. All right, wonderful. And thank you so much for coming in. Mikel Basson, Guild of President, Guild President, the UEK Phil Campus, uh, for sharing. Thank you so much, Professor Winston Moore, for being here with us, Deputy Principal, UEK Phil, and Managing Director, RBC Royal Bank Barbados, Shimon McIntosh, telling us all about the RBC Race for the Kids coming up this Sunday, April 14th. Make sure you register. It's only $35, half for children. Uh, come on out and do like the students did last year. Um, of course, Mikhail says they showed up and they showed out. Uh, it's a short run, so you absolutely can be a part of it. It's a wonderful cause. It's all about our young people. It's time for another break. When we come back on Morning Barbados, mm -hmm. we're going to move on and feature a very interesting young man. Stay with us. Morning, morning, morning. Tune in to CBC Newsnight for the NISS Business Report. A comprehensive look at the local, regional, and international business Microsoft. world every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday during CBC Newsnight. Okay brought to you by the National right, Insurance okay, yeah, can, Security can Service. More right, than a contribution, right, it's your Thank lifeline. Every day at 7 p.m., we bring you a comprehensive news package because keeping you informed is our number one priority. Whether it's local, regional, or international stories, our commitment is to you and keeping you reliably informed. Join us every day at 7 p.m. for CBC Newsnight. The facts say Morning Barbados reaches an audience of over 50,000 and Newsnight reaches over 56,000. It's simple. When you advertise, you're getting your message to over 50,000 of your potential customers. Make the call to CBC Sales Department today and watch your business grow. Contact us at 467-5559 or email marketing at cbc.bb. From the beautiful shores of the Gem of the Caribbean, Barbados, home of the amazing Harrison's Cave, the tantalizing Oyston's Bay Garden, our historic garrison. Morning, morning, morning. Good morning. Good morning to you. Welcome back to Morning Barbados. We have just a few minutes left, just about eight minutes to go before eight o'clock. And we promised that we were going to share you, uh, share with you a very inspiring story. So we move into that now. Welcome Jason Green to join us around the table. Good to see you. Good to see you too. All right. So April is Amputee and Disability Awareness Month. And you're here in Barbados to share your story and assist the Limbs for Life Foundation. In, in all of their work. So talk to me first of all about how you came to this place. I think it's important 
for people to know because sometimes when we think about disability and certainly amputations, a lot of people, uh, they, they don't place themselves in that particular place where it could be them. Mm -hmm. Well, it started back when I first started dating my girlfriend. Her father had taken her here on vacations and he got really sick when we first started dating. I didn't get the time to tell him how much I appreciated his daughter. And um, so he passed away. So I said, you know what? I didn't get to talk to your dad, but I think let's set up a tribute to Barbados in honor of his name. And within six months, we were here. We came to Barbados the first time. Um, this is my third time in Barbados. Um, I, we can feel his presence every time we're here. And I know that he is watching over the good things that is happening. And um, I feel really good about carrying on this work. And uh, yeah. So you've been living as an amputee for many, many years. Talk to me about that, how, how it is for you on really a daily basis. Well, I, re I really don't think about it anymore. It's been like 45 years. It's more of like a natural instinct just to do it and to be a part of whatever I'm supposed to be a part of. I don't think of myself as handicapped. I think of myself as a participant in this life like everybody else. And this is just, this is a blessing for me to live it in, at another angle. But it's all still the same. It all meets up in the same way. So how did it happen? Back when I was nine years old, I was, my father had gone away to help a family move from one house to another. And he mowed part of the field, but the side yard wasn't mowed. I had seen how he did it and how he ran the mower. So I was like, I can do the side yard. It's no big deal. Um, so I hopped on the mower. This was before you, they had the shut off when you fell off the seat. So I was backing up. I was all done. And I was going by the flower garden where my mom's flowers were. And uh, I remember there was a pine tree behind me and there were roots sticking out of the ground. And the tractor started going like this. It was a two-piece tractor. Either, either you could walk behind it or you could connect a seat. And I had the seat hooked up on it. So it started hitting the roots and I slipped off and my foot hit the ground and I went to go get back on the seat, but it was jackknifing. So I hit part of the seat and then I fell back on the ground and it got up on top of me and I tried to get it off, but I was nine years old, I was just a little kid. And uh, yeah, I lost my, I lost my left foot, uh, part of my leg a little bit up higher and some toes on my right foot. Um, but yeah, I think as I look back, and all that's happened in my life, I wouldn't change it. I wouldn't change it because I've reached so many people in a positive way throughout the years. And that has led me here to Barbados to help the amputee population here um, in, in certain ways. All right, so tell me about the work that you're doing uh, in, in this particular area. For once, for one, I am um, right, I'm meeting the amputees right now and getting to know them personally. Um, last week I was at but St. Matthias Church in Easter to and I met a, to you. Um, a right. old gentleman who has a left, limb. Right, you only got two but we want to keep on and then record the rest of the needs, interview when the show is finished, right? He needs a higher grade prosthetic limb. That's another thing that I'll be doing. I'm working through stride prosthetics um, and there's a process that's going to happen, and through that process, I will be able to bring higher, prosthetic, higher grade prosthetic limbs so the amputees here can have a better lifestyle. 
All right. Well, you know, here's where we are going to wrap for our viewing audience for now. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're going to get to see the rest of this interview with Jason. Uh, of course, here's where we, we say goodbye to you. Tomorrow, you're going to get to see the rest of our discussion with Jason about his life living from nine years old to this point as an amputee and the work that he's going to continue to do with us here in Barbados to help bring amputees along. So make sure you tune in for that. Before we go, though, we want to remind you what else is coming up on tomorrow's Morning Barbados presentation. Conversations on CARICOM with Ambassador Kamishong, where we take a look at Haiti, we're going to do an in-depth discussion on where we are as CARICOM and where they are as well as we continue to play a role in the entire process to be steered to successful conclusion. So that's tomorrow. Also, the BCC and DSU have forged a partnership with DSU offering bachelor's degrees in agricultural science, math, biology, and a few other areas for BCC students. We're going to tell you more about that relationship between the two institutions and how you can get into it. Talk about the MOU and the historic signing that is actually happening today. So an immediate follow-up on that. Plus, St. Stephen's Anglican Church, they're having an event called An Evening of Soul Soothing Music. That's coming up on April 13th at LT1 at the University of the West Indies CAFL campus. And we're going to have a few of the ladies from the church who are integral in putting this event on. They're going to be in to share with us on that all-important event as well. So that's all tomorrow for our presentation on Tuesday of Morning Barbados. Remember, you can reach out to us on all socials, or you can email us at morningbarbados at cbc.bb. Now, on behalf of the entire crew, I certainly hope you have a wonderful day today. Remember to wear your smiles as you go through your day. Do something great for somebody, and most importantly, see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. Barbados, get up. Good morning. Good morning, Barbados. Good morning.